Um, we should start because the uh, presentation is pretty dense. So, um, this session is mostly about my story uh, with G1. Uh, we had customers that um, started using G1. They, had, they went into issues. So, what happened was that I had to research how G1 actually worked in order to be able to have the customers that we had. And uh, this is basically a, you know, the story, the tale of my story in researching how G1 works and uh, what is the algorithms that are behind G1 and how you, by knowing how G1 works, how you can actually understand it and then tune it. Um, so I work for an American company called Webtide. We provide services for uh, the Jetty server container. So if you need, for example, tuning advice, if you need uh, how to use HTTP2, um, I gave a presentation yesterday about this. If you need custom code, if you have issues, problems, whatever, we are there to actually help. And you're talking directly with us. We are the committer of the Jerry project. So you basically get the best people that knows about Jerry. So let's start and dive deep into G1. Um, G1 is the new replacement. It's a, a low pose collector. The first paper that dates back to 2004, so it's a, it has a long history in theory and in academical papers. Um, it, fir it first appeared uh, more than three years ago, so it's now like a stable collector. It's a long-term replacement for CMS and it's scheduled to be the default collector for JDK 9. The reason behind this choice is that um, right now in these days we low poses collector are actually preferred. If you are on the client side for uh, UI uh, applications then you really want to stay within those 16 milliseconds in order to render 30, 60 frames per second on your application. And if you are on the server side, you really don't want to have your clients using a browser and connecting to your application to pose for a long time. So um, low poses are important. And that's why G1 came in. G1 has been designed to be really, really easy to tune. Basically, this is exactly how much you are supposed to tune G1. You just specify the max size of the heap, and then you tell G1 how long you would like it to wait in order to, to do the garbage collection cycles. Um, this is a, a suggestion to G1 that G1 will try to respect. We'll see that this is not always true, and uh, we'll see how it actually works. Um, like all the other collectors in, uh, in Hotspot, uh, G1 is a generational collector, so it implements two algorithms. One is for the young generation, and uh, it's a stop the world, typical parallel copying collector. And, um, and then there is another algorithm uh, for the old generation. Now, while the young generation algorithm is pretty typical and similar to all the others, the old generation uh, algorithm is quite different, and you really need to understand how that works because um, it's, it's very different from all the others. We'll go into the details, so don't worry. Uh, very important slide here, keep always the logging enabled, even in production. These um, uh, switches, a command line, will give you a wealth of information that will be critical in order for you to understand what's going on in your garbage collector. If you don't enable these ones, then basically you run into problems and you have no idea of what happened. And then what you have to do, you have to stop your JVM, restart it with these flags, but then you have lost information of what went on uh, during the problem. And the problem may not be appear again or maybe appear two weeks later or whatever. So, Please always keep these guys enabled. So G1 memory layout. Uh, who's familiar with this slide here? Oh, few people, so many few people? Okay, so or maybe you're shy. So forget about it. <laughs> G1 is completely different. So G1, what it does, it tries to divide the heap into 2,000 regions, uh, smaller regions. Uh, these regions are, have a tag associated with them and um, there are Eden region, survivor regions, old generation region, and then there is a special new tag called the humongous region. Um, these regions are the one where contain a single object that occupies more than half 
of the size of the region. So in a graphical way, this is more or less like a G1 uh, memory layout look li looks like. Okay? So you have many, many regions. Some of them are empty. Some are old regions, so they have this tag attached. And uh, add regions, survivor, humongous, and this is how it looks like. So what happens when the JVM starts? Okay, so JVM starts, it allocates like most of the heap and then divides the heap in those 2,000 regions and then marks part of those as add-on regions. Then your application starts, it starts to allocate, right? So where does it allocate? G1 chooses the first region and then you start to fill objects in there. Eventually the particular region gets full, so G1 picks a second region and then you start allocating there until it gets full. Then third region and so forth, right? Until when all the add-on regions are full, then a young generation collection happens, okay? So how does G1 pick the number of add-on regions? Well, it picks the number of add-on regions based on the suggestion that it gave to G1 of how long do you want to wait at most for the garbage collection to happen, right? If you have a very large amount of add-on regions, it could be that G1 takes a lot of time to process them all. If you have a very short number of them, G1 takes very little time to process them all, right? So this is really important. It's a key of the, this presentation. G1 controls the times that it takes to do garbage collection by enlarging or restricting the number of add-on regions that it's working on, right? Makes sense. However, applications do not only allocate new objects, and that's it. They typically also modify pointers of existing objects, right? So it may be possible that you have an object that lives in an old generation that points to an object that lives in an add-on generation, right? For example, imagine you start a Spring application. When Spring starts, it creates a map that contains all your beans, right? So that map is created at the very initial stages of your application, and it's very likely that that map, after a few cycles of garbage collection, goes into an old generation uh, region, right? Because it stays there forever, for all the life of your application. However, it is possible that you actually create new objects or new beans, and those beans are put into that map, and at that point, you have just created a new object, and you have put it into that map. So you have the map pointing from an old generation region to a new generation region, right? Pointing to the new bean. So G1 must keep track of these pointers. Why it needs to keep track of these guys? Well, because this is how an add-on region will look like, okay? You just created the new bean, it's E, but Nobody's pointing to it if you just look at this region, okay? So if you just look at this region, you say, okay, there's D pointing to F, there's E here, but nobody's pointing to them, so they're garbage. Like, if nobody references them, I can collect them because they're just garbage. However, the situation is not exactly this one. The situation is more like this one. You have an old region and you have other objects that are pointing to these guys and keep them alive. All right. So, for example, in this case, you have a root that points to A, that points to C, that points to D, that points to F. So these are alive, but this guy is not pointed by anyone from outside. So these two are actually garbage. However, if I just look at this guy, I see that there is a pointer to it. So I cannot say, well, you are for sure garbage. So G1, what it has to do, it has to allocate additional data structures. Um, they are called the remember set, and they're called the card table. So the remember set is associated for every add-on regions and says, OK, I know that there is a place here, this slice, that contains objects that point to objects into this region. So I so this basically contains external pointers to this region, entering the add-on region, right? The car table is an optimization that says, okay, instead of scanning all 
the old regions and looking for pointers to add-on regions, okay, I just say divide the heap using a card table and uh, I just mark the card tables that are actually pointing to add-on regions with, a, you know, like a bit. I just flip a bit here and it says mark, mark it red so that I can say, okay, instead of scanning all the regions, I can just, you know, follow the pointer, go here, and I know that in this slice, there will be two objects pointing here. So it's an optimization to say, I just want to scan that particular region that I know it contains objects pointing to the add-on region. And uh, here comes the first uh, interesting point. How does G1 do it? Well, it installs what is called a write barrier. Every time you do this operation in Java, okay, so you are modifying a reference field pointer, then this write barrier installed by the JVM triggers and says, oh, you are changing an object. Okay, before I'm actually in the JVM switching the addresses of the pointers, okay, let me do some additional work. And the additional work, it is exactly this one that I showed you here, basically marking the card and, you know, possibly doing some work on the remember set. And this is the way G1 is actually doing things. So whenever I in create this pointer, all right, so from B to E, the right barrier triggers and G1 says, okay, marking this card table, then I'm updating the pointer. However, updating directly the, the card table or updating directly in the remember set would be too much work. So again, another layer of indirection, there is a queue where all these changes are actually recorded and queued. All right? And then there are, um, there are threads that G1 starts, and these threads are basically called the uh, refinement threads. The queue where all the modifications are put is called the uh, uh, dirty card queue, and it, it is divided in these four zones. So the white zone basically says, okay, every time there is a pointer update, I need to record this information, let me put it in the queue, okay, but I'm still in the white area here, okay, so I'm filling up the white area, I do nothing, no problem. However, if the application modifies a lot of pointers, Okay. Eventually, all the items that, that I accumulate in the white area enter the green area. So in the green area, G1 starts a refinement threads and starts in background to do this updating of the remember set. So it goes into the card table, scans that, and then updates the remember set and says, okay, this set and region is now up to date. The more you add modification to pointers, the more you enter the yellow zone, the, and then you enter the red zone, and therefore G1 allocates more and more threads in order to do this background work. All right? So this was one thing that I need to research because there, was there is basically very little information online on how G1 actually works for refinement threads. You can find, oh, there are refinement threads. Yes, but what do they exactly do? Is, are they important for my tuning? Well, if you have an application that actually modifies a lot of pointers, then you will see, you could see that the refinement threads are entering, well, the number of updates enter the, the red zone, and at that point, the application, and not the refinement threads, is the one that is making the updates. So basically, G1 says, eh, I could do some work in the background, but you have so much work that now you do the work. Right? So the application will slow down because now it has additional work to do. And by slowing down, it allows the refinement threads to catch up and pr process all the updates. Let's see in details what are the G1, GC phases uh, now. So when G1 fills up all the add-on regions, then triggers a young generation garbage collection, okay? And uh, what happens exactly in there? Well, G1 stops the world, and uh, which means it stops all the application threads uh, from what they are doing right now. When they're all stopped, 
then G1 knows that the heap cannot be modified anymore because all the application threads are stopped. So now it's the time that G1 can actually do its work. So the first thing that it does is it builds what is called the collection set. A collection set is basically what is it that I have to work on, right? Because it's a young generation collection, it needs to collect all the add-on regions and all the survival regions. So you just put all those regions into this collection set and then start processing them. The first phase is, of course, the root scanning. Uh, G1 has to understand what are the external pointers to the heap. So this, for example, means a local variable that you have just allocated in your thread, right? So if you have a local variable in your thread, that's an active variable. I cannot collect it. It's not garbage. It's a variable that I'm actually using. Right? So that's a root, or if you have a static field in a class, or if you have you know, pointers from the old generation to the add-on generation. So he starts collecting all the roots. And then what? He starts navigating these roots and the object graph, graph that is below them. Right? It starts from a root object and then navigates all the pointers and then recursively for each children navigates the pointer and down, down, down until it reaches all the objects that are alive. Um, while it's pr navigating the object graph, it is doing things. And we'll see in a second what, what is this. The second phase that it's doing is, okay, I found all the roots. Now I need to update the remember set information. So I need to process the buffers that I have put in the dirty card queue, okay, and process all of them. Part of them are processed by the refinement threads, but at the moment the garbage collection triggers, the refinement threads may still have some work to do. Okay? So you stop the refinement threads and then take all what's remain, update the remember set. Once the remember set is updated, then I can process the remember set and say, okay, okay, now I know exactly that there are pointers from these regions pointing here, so let me just follow the pointers and make sure that the objects in this region are really alive, like mark all of them. And then there is a fourth phase that happens during the object graph navigation. Okay, so start navigating the graph and say, okay, I got the root, let me copy the root into a new region, survival region. Okay. Then let me navigate the pointers. Oh, look, I found a child. Let me copy the child as well. Navigate again the child. Grandchildren. Let me move the grandchildren and so forth down into the object graph, right? So by navigating the object graph, it is also copying the object graph into new stuff, into new stuff. Of course, when you navigate the object graph, you're just moving the live objects. Those that are garbage remain behind and they will just be thrown away. Okay? That particular region will become a free region and will be reused for uh, future work. While it is also navigating the graph, G1 is also tracking what kind of objects it is navigating. And in particular, it is tracking references as in Java lang ref reference, so weak references, soft references, and, and stuff like that. And while it is navigating the object, and say, oh, look, this one is a, an object that I know. It's of type Java lang ref weak reference. Okay? So it puts them aside and say, yeah, I need to process you guys a little bit later. And that's the fifth phase, reference processing. So it does the weak reference processing and everything. Not only that, also, what is it the G1 does? While it is navigating all this object graph, it also keeps track of the times it takes to do each of these phases. And this is really critical because that's exactly what we want to respect. If the user has said, hey, I want a max pose of 100 milliseconds, then G1, while it's doing its work, have to say, okay, how much it took me to process, I don't know, 500 regions, okay? Well, it took me 200 milliseconds. And then G1 can reason about this and say, well, if I got 200 region and it took me 200 milliseconds, then perhaps if I cut the number of regions in half, then I can respect the time that the user told me to respect. So it just says, okay, next time I'm going to shrink the add-on, have 
a smaller number of regions so that I can stay within the limit that the user required me to stay in. Okay. So this is graphically what happens. We have this situation and uh, we take the Eden regions and the survival regions, we scan them and then we all the objects that I'm navigating, we move them to, G1 moves them to new regions like these two, which of course will, uh, well, there's also the survival region. So what happens? That the new two regions become survival regions, of course, because I have done one GC cycle. And this one was a survival region, but the objects inside the region were so old that they basically say, okay, now you are promoted to be an old region now. Okay, and of course I'm copying only the live object so if any old guy that was living here actually became garbage well it remains there but who cares it will be overwritten by in the next uh, you know use of that region so no big deal All right so clear so far it is really important the most important thing here is part of the details of how it works is that while G1 is working, it is keeping track of the times, and because it's keeping track of the times, it can actually make decisions about how many regions do I have to use in order to stay within the limit that you gave me. Okay, that's the most important thing. Now let's take a look at the old generation, do you see, and how it works. So G1 schedules an old generation collection based on the total heap usage. In, uh, by default, this is 45%. So whenever you have a, a heap that is 45% full, including Eden, Survivor, and Old, okay, when you get 45%, G1 says, okay, better that I start to, you know, an old generation collection. Now, the old generation collection is a strange beast, but we'll go into the details how it works. Um, the first thing that, that you have to do in G1 is basically this. I want to get rid of the garbage in the old regions. Okay, That's the most important thing that I have to do uh, during an old generation collection. So first of all, I have to understand what is it that is alive and what is it that is garbage. All right. To do this, G1 performs an algorithm that is called marking. I guess you've heard about this. In particular, G1 uses an algorithm, that a concurrent algorithm. It is marking the objects while your application is running. This is pretty smart because it doesn't... Um, typically, you have many objects in the old generation that are alive. So if you have to stop the application and then mark all the objects, it will take a lot of time. So they figured out an algorithm where the garbage collection can actually run during the, uh, the application at the same time the application is running and then mark all the objects that are alive. And remember, the application is modifying pointers. So maybe the garbage collection passes and says, okay, this object is alive, but then the application switches a pointer and then that object becomes garbage. Oops. But, these are smart guys. So the algorithm that they invented is called three color marking and it works in this way. First thing that G1 is doing is stopping the world for a little moment and collecting all the roots. Okay? These guys. And it paints them black. All right? Then it says, okay, I'm done with the root. Now we can proceed in parallel. Okay, so it takes the first route and I say, okay, let me follow your pointers. Oh, look, you have only one pointer. It points to this object. Let me mark your, child, your child gray. Okay, gray because you're not yet processed. Okay, and puts the gray object into a queue. Same for this route. They actually point to the same object. So just put the gray object into a queue. All right. And then recursively goes into this queue and says, okay, let me pick up the first object. Happens to be, for example, this one. And let me process this guy, okay? So let's follow the pointer, points to this, this object. So because it's the only pointer, let me mark your child gray. And because 
that was your only pointer, then you're done, and I mark you black. Okay? Then it says, okay, let's pick this object now. Okay, let's follow the first pointer. I say, it has a child, so let's mark this guy gray. But I'm not done here yet because I need to process the second pointer. So when I follow the second pointer, then I mark the child gray and mark this guy black. All right? And of course, this guy is going back into the queue. And then I just restart the whole process. Turns out that, you know, for simplicity reasons, um, these objects either have scalar pointer, like for example, boolean, int, so I don't need to follow a pointer, or the pointer is null. So it doesn't point to anything, don't need to follow. So the marking ends here. As you can see, white objects are garbage. All right? So what remains white, I don't care, it's garbage. The other thing that you could have noticed, if you start from here, it's there is a gray wave front that advances. Okay, so there is a gray or black, and then followed by the black one that advances. And the key thing is that there is never a pointer that goes from a black object to a white. If that happens, then that's a big problem, and we will see in a second why. Okay, remember that I told you that this happens concurrently with the application? Right, so the application also is allowed to modify pointers. So let's take this particular example. It's called the lost object problem. So I'm scanning these guys. I'm about to scan object B. But before I take the chance to scan object B, the application does this. Duck. Okay, switches the pointers and say, oh, okay, uh, we're good. I mean, A was already processed, was already black, but now the application has made A to point to C. So it's a black to white pointer. Dangerous, right? So, well, marking resumes and says, okay, uh, let me analyze B now. Oh, B is, has a pointer, but the pointer is null. Okay, we're done, B. Uh, A was already processed, it's already black, and when I processed A, it was pointing to null, so don't have to do anything. Now, this is bad because now you take these three black objects, you're copying them to a new region, but you forget to copy this guy because it's white. And now you have a pointer from a good object to an object that will be existing in a region that is going to be reused and eventually will be overwritten, etc. And this is really bad because it's a dangling pointer and it's corrupt uh, memory. So that's not good. So what is it that G1 does to prevent this? It uses an algorithm called uh, snapshot at the beginning. Again, this was a term that you go around into online resources and you say, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, always say snapshot at the beginning, snapshot at the beginning, but there's actually no explanation of what's going on. I mean, how does it work? It, it is important. Do I have to know it in order to understand G1 or, or not? So what G1 does is that, again, it uses a write barrier to detect when b.c equal null. So let's go back here. Okay, whenever this pointer is deleted, tack, G1 triggers and say, oh, you're modifying a pointer, let me do some additional work before I actually nullify that pointer. Okay, because G1 knows everything about the objects, it can say, well, I know that you just deleted a pointer to object C. Let me put C object into a special place because I need to process it later. Okay. This special place is called the, um, the snapshot at the beginning queue, okay? And what G1 does is basically say this, I assume that C will remain alive, okay? And uh, it could be that, for example, the application just deleted this pointer, but it never actually created this pointer. So what happens in this case? That C will be retained as so-called floating garbage. 
So C is basically a dead object, okay? But because we are not really sure that it's really dead, G1 says, okay, let me stay conservative. Let me put C objects aside, assume that they will stay alive, okay? And then in the next cycle, then at that point, I will figure out the C. Actually, nobody points to C anymore, so I'll get rid of it, all right? This technique is called snapshot at the beginning because you see that the initial object graph, there was this one, is not modified. I mean, I'm not taking um, any processing just because I have created this new uh, reference. So I'm assuming that the initial object graph, which is this one, remains the same. So that's why it is called snapshot at the beginning. What I am processing is this object, this object, this object, and this object, like it was at the beginning, even if the graph changed in this way. All right? That's why it's called snapshot at the beginning. All right, so that's another thing that I, that I researched and explained, and now I understand better how G1 works. Well, maybe it doesn't help me much, but at least now I know what I'm talking about. And I understand when they reference things like snapshot at the beginning, whatever. So let's go into the G1 old generation collection phases. So G1 stops the world, performs a young generation collection, which is weird because I'm actually doing an old generation collection. However, I need to find the roots, right? And I need to stop the world in order to find the roots. Those are the objects that I, I have to be absolutely sure that they are alive, all right? So it says, you know what? This exact processing is the same processing that I'm doing when I'm doing a young generation collection. So let me piggyback that into a young generation collection. You know, piggyback is, I, I don't know how familiar you are with English, but for me it was a strange word, is when you carry your children on your back. So that's piggybacking. It means like someone walks for you, <laughs> right? Because you carry the kid. So this is what happens. The old generation collection says, uh, G1 says, hey, young generation, do this work, additional work for me too, okay? Uh, find the roots for me. And so G1 does, runs the young generation collection, finds the root, and then G1 just says, okay, you application threads, you can start now. I'm done with the young generation. And at that point, however, because it's an old generation, the concurrent marking starts. So G1 navigates all the objects graph of the old generation, finds all the live objects, and then just mark them all black, right? So now you have all these black objects there. However, the fact that you have figured out um, that the black objects is not enough because now you have to move them in order to free space, right? You want to la leave the garbage behind by moving the live objects to a new region, all right? And this also helps because it is going to compact the objects. And that's the new thing that uh, G1 has um, on uh, and, and the new feature that G1 has with respect to CMS. Okay, CMS was not compacting the old generation, uh, but G1 does exactly because it finds all the live objects in the old generation and then copies them into new regions, leaving the garbage behind. And by copying them, it can actually pack them better, right? While marking proceed, okay, I'm navigating the object graph. What is it the other very interesting thing that I can do? Okay, I'm navigating all the object graph. Well, I can compute the per region liveness information. I can say, oh, look, this particular old generation region, there are no objects that are alive. But this one, there is only one object. This one, full of objects that are still alive, all right? So, G1 is trying to be smart. Whenever it navigates the object graph, it tries to collect as many inf information as possible uh, because then it's going to use that information. So phases. Um, stop the world, concurrent marking, then stops the world again, and then it does a remark phase. In this phase, the remark phase, there is the snapshot of the beginning queue processing, 
remember the C objects, those guys will say, oh, okay, let's assume you are alive. Okay, I'll process you as if you are alive. And then there is the Java Lang ref reference processing as well as before. Then G1 says, well, if during the object traversal, during marking, I found a region that I did not traverse because it was full of garbage, well, that's basically full of garbage, so I can just recycle that immediately. Okay? That's called the cleanup phase. Empty old regions, meaning full of garbage, empty of live objects, are immediately recycled. And then application threads are resumed again. So this is how it looks in the logs. Initial mark, piggybacked on a young generation, then scanning concurrently the roots, uh, concurrent marking, you know, in this particular case, it took 1.6 seconds to traverse all the objects, okay? Imagine that you really want to have a low latency application, but, you know, it just takes 1.6 seconds to traverse all the objects in the old generation. That's a lot of time, and you don't want to have a 1.6 seconds pause uh, if you're going for low latency. But fortunately, this is done concurrently with the application, so you're good. You're basically, your application continues running. Remark phase, 48 milliseconds. Cleanup phase, 55 milliseconds. You see here, I just recovered two gigabytes of regions from 16 to 14. Um, they were full of garbage. They were all the regions full of garbage. Right, so, but what is the current status then? Right, so I have navigated all this, I marked all the live objects black, but I haven't moved them yet, right? I just recycled the empty regions, but what about those regions that contain a few live objects and mostly dead objects, okay? I haven't moved actually those objects yet. So G1 says, uses another trick, which says, well, let me piggyback this activity onto a young generation collection again, right? It was already in doing the marking, and uh, now I ask the young generation collection to also do the moving of the objects that we saw before. So during an old generation collection, the collection set changes. Remember, in, during a young generation, there were Eden and survival regions, right? But during an old generation, what is called like a mixed GC, okay, there are Eden, survivor, and a small portion, one eighth, of the old regions that I have to consider for cleaning up, right? Because for G1, basically every region is exactly the same. It doesn't matter uh, about the tag. Okay, it just takes, okay, I need to process this region, right? So let me find the roots, let me find all the live objects, navigate through them while I'm navigating, copying them and compacting, okay? It doesn't matter if it's an Eden region, a survival region, or an old region. What I have to do is exactly the same. Navigating the object graph, copying them, and compacting, right? So because this was already available in the young algorithm, then the old algorithm just tells the young algorithm, well, just do a little bit of work for me, okay? One eighth of the regions that I, have, that I know that you have to process, do it for me, right? And then, which ones? Well, because when I traverse the graph, I know what are the, the regions, the old regions that are most full of garbage, all right? I can process those first, because I would get the maximum benefit out of those, right? Because if I just have one object in the old region and I recycle the whole region, then I get a lot of garbage thrown away and just one little object that gets copied. So I have very little work to do and I get a full region free again, right? So in, during this mix that you see, what G1 does is say, okay, let me take the most full of garbage, garbage first, okay, full of garbage regions, and one-eighth of those, and tell 
a, the young algorithm to work them out. Okay, then okay, you're done. Then let me take the second eighth of those regions and give them to the young algorithm and clean them up. The third, the fourth, etc., etc. Okay. Eventually, I will arrive at a point where um, maybe the cost of passing those regions to the young algorithm it is going to be too much. I mean, for example, imagine you have a, an old region where you just have one object that is garbage and all the others are alive, okay? Well, there's no point in cleaning that single object. I can just say, well, you know what? Let's keep the single object as garbage in there, not even bother to process that region, okay? It's okay, I waste a little bit, but who cares? Right? So this is controlled by these two parameters. Um, the regions with the most garbage are chosen first, but I can afford to waste some heap, heap space. So I'm basically saying, well, you know what, when, you know, waste 5% of the heap and retain some garbage in there, don't even bother to process that garbage. Um, and so mixed GCs are stopped whenever you know, uh, the, the old region garbage is less than waste threshold. And, um, you know, maybe this stops, you know, you do your first eight, second eight, third eight, fourth eight, fifth eight, and then you realize, well, you know what, it's going to cost me so much to go until the eighth eight that uh, I don't even care. Like, let's stop here. We're good. Okay. I've already recycled a lot of garbage. We're good. Graphically, this is what happens. Um, it's a young, it's a mixed, you see. So it's both a young and an old, right? So this is the old generation, the one eighth that is gain, getting added to the collection set. So young generation side exactly as before, but now we also have this guy here that gets copied. So it goes in this way, right? It remains an old generation, but very likely it is much less occupied because I just copied the live object, okay? We are done with the algorithms. <laughs> um, let's go into some practical advice now, all right? So what do you have to do? So first thing is try to avoid at all cost that G1 goes back in the full GC mode. Uh, it is incredibly slow. It's, um, it is even worse because G1 is uh, supposed to be used with big hips, right? So if you are going to full GC, and there are cases, we'll see them, where you can go there, then it is going to be painfully slow, okay? Don't wanna absolutely go there. If you enable this switch, you will understand each garbage collection, why it happened. And especially if you go and get a full GC, you will know what is it that causes it. So enable this flag because it is really important to understand what's happened. The second thing that you have to um, avoid is what is called the two space exhausted. Okay, imagine you have a NEEP of in this particular situation. Okay, you have just one region that is free, and now. The G1 says, hey, you know, I, I need to go into a young generation collection. Okay, no problem. So let me collect this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and then figure out the live objects and then copy them to free regions, right? But the only free region is this one. What if the objects that I have to copy do not fit in that single region? Then uh, I don't know where to put them. That's where G1 goes back into full GC and says, oh, okay, I give up. My algorithm doesn't work anymore here. I don't have enough free regions. So let me stop everything now. And let me do the good old single threaded full GC algorithm. Okay, so it starts from here, copy a little bit, da, 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 da. very slow. You don't want it to do this. How do you fix this problem? Well, pretty simple. Increase the max heap size. You need to give G1, typically, more space than CMS. And this is the reason. You really want to have G1 with a lot of maneuver. 
uh, to, to be able to never end up in this situation and have G1 to be able to waste a little space, to be able to, you know, stop the mix that you see at a point where you say, well, you know, even if you retain a little garbage, it's okay, all right? Leave it there forever, even for the whole duration of the JVM, I don't care, right? But you need to give him space. So, if you were used to tune CMS for a certain size, please, for G1, enlarge that size. It is going to be needed. The other thing is try to avoid humongous allocations. So, remember I told you at the beginning, humongous regions are those where they contain a single object that is really big. Typically, these are uh, byte arrays or car arrays like big strings or big bytes, uh, byte arrays. Now, these are uh, particularly bad because uh, humongous object in the G1 algorithms go to a special treatment, which uh, implies that more code is being executed. So if you have a lot of humongous allocation where you allocate like big arrays and stuff like that, then G1 has to do more work. It has to treat those humongous objects specially and it has to do more work. So you don't really want to do that. So here's below an example. Let's imagine that uh, you have a max heap size of 32 gigabytes, okay? Because G1 always try to have 2K regions, then each region is going to be 16 megabyte, right? 16 megabyte, what it means that the Humongous object region must be half of that, so it's eight megabyte, right? Well, but your application is actually allocating, you, you figure this out by looking at adaptive site policies. It tells you, hey, I'm allocating a 12 gigabyte array here, a 12 megabyte array, oops. And um, so you know that you're allocating 12 megabytes, okay? So what is it that you need for to, to make sure that 12 megabyte array do not end up to be a humongous object. Well, you need the, the humongous limit to be, say, 16 megabyte, so it's bigger, okay, okay? And because that's the humongous limit, it means that the region size is gonna be 32 megabytes, right? It's double that. So by setting the region size to 32 megabytes, boom, problem solved. All the humongous allocation that you had before, they're just gone, they don't happen anymore. Okay, and that's good. Try to avoid a lot of Java lang ref references, okay? Weak references, soft reference, they're not, well, they're cool, but they're always processed during stop the world phases. And um, stop the world phases take time. So if you have lots of them, it takes time to process them. So try to have um, less of those. Now, turns out that there are places where you don't think the weak references are actually allocated, but for example, if you, look, if you use thread locals, they are allocated. If you use RMI, they are allocated. Who here has a management console like JMC, JConsole, JVisualVM connected to a production machine? There you go, right? So that's using RMI and that's allocating weak references, every method call that you make. So, you know, typically they're not that many, but be, know that this can happen. Real world example now, like a war story. So this is a customer of us, um, it's an online chess game application. Uh, this single application has 20,000 requests per second on a single Jerry server, and uh, it's one server, 64 gigabyte of RAM, and two times 16 cores, so it's 30 cores, pretty big machine. Uh, the allocation rate of this application was uh, about between 0 0.5 to 1.2 gigabytes per second. So just imagine this application, one second has passed, whew, one gigabyte of stuff allocated, right? <laughs> it's, it's a lot. So you really need to get this guy good up and running. So, and we worked on a CMS to G1 migration. The problem with CMS was that for this allocation rate, for this many requests per second, 
CMS was not able to keep up anymore. Uh, it was fragmenting the old generation. It was not keeping up with the um, with the hip size that we gave him. If we enlarged the hip size, it turned out that the times to process the young generation were too long. All right. So we we didn't have any more maneuver uh, because if we enlarged the heap more times, if we kept the heap at that size the garbage collection was happening in less than one second. So basically the application was garbage and collecting all the time. And there was little time for the application to actually run. And this was bad because, you know, that's, that's not what you want. So we said, eh, let's move to G1. So we changed the JVM, changed the GC algorithm, and then we said, no, nah, no problem. First problem that we encountered was this. Oh, sorry. Oh, Metaspace. Oh, but they told us that the permanent generation was gone. I mean, no more out of memory error because of the permanent generation. Great. However, now there is a thing called the Metaspace, which is uh, <laughs> the permanent generation, basically. Now, it doesn't throw any more a out of memory error when, when it's full, but it does a full GC. And this actually happened to last, in our case, 13 seconds. And this application for moving chess uh, pieces requires like 250 milliseconds. So 13 seconds was just out of, out of mind. We couldn't actually do it. The problem with this is that you have no idea how much meta space you actually need until you actually try it. So my suggestion here is start big and then try to keep an eye on it. And then if you actually hit a full GC, Ah, you know that the next time you have to double up the size and then hope that it doesn't hit, hit you again, right? Second problem, the max target pose that is specified at the beginning. We specified 250, uh, but this was actually the percentiles that we got after parsing the logs for a 24-hour run, right? It turns out that only half of the garbage collection cycles were less than 250. All the others, the other half, was more than that. So the max target pose is not really the max target pose that G1 tries to do. It's more like a median target pose, right? So you have to take this into account if you really want, do not want to go to three times the target pose, OK? So you know, for us, 760 was kind of bad, but you know, tolerable. Uh, we kept it in this way, but um, there are effects that happen if you try to reduce this guy, and we'll see them in a second. The third issue is built in G1. It is the, how the algorithm of G1 works. So what happens? Remember the most important thing that I told you? G1 tries to respect the max target pose by shrinking the young generation. When it has to do the mixed GC, not only it has to take in account all the, all, all the Eden, all the survivor, but it also has to take into account one-eighth of the old generations, regions, right? But taking that into account says, OK, if I have more work to do, then what I have to do? I have to shrink the young generation because I have to process less hidden regions in order to make time for, in order to be able to process the old regions. All right? So in our particular case, we got this. We went from an Eden being 12 gigabytes down to 600 megabytes. So we went to 12 to 0 0.6. That's a 20 time reduction in the Eden size. It's going this, this, OK? However, there's a trick here. Is the application changing anything? No, it still has a 1 gigabyte per second allocation rate. It still does that, all right? So. If now your add-in was 12 gigabyte and you're allocating one gigabyte per second, it takes 12 seconds to fill it, OK? But if you are 0 0.6, it takes 0 0.6 seconds to fill it now, right? 
So, not good. There is a, a parameter called the maximum mutator utilization that says, I give you a window, okay, of say two seconds. Then I move this window through time. And I want to see in those two seconds how much time is being spent in garbage collection and how much time is actually spent by the application running, okay? Certainly, what I want, I want as much as application time as possible during that particular window. But this is what happened in that particular case, right? So we had this event, uh, young you see, 10 seconds, more or less, young you see, 10 seconds, young you see, and then at this point, the uh, mixer you see mechanism started to kick in. Eden shrunk. Pum, 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 pum. Mixed, you see, were happening very quickly until they actually finished consuming all the old generation objects and eventually went back to 10 seconds. I'm almost done. So this is the MMU, uh, sorry, the add-in size, 12 gigabytes down to 0 0.6. This is the MMU for a two seconds window. So. You see, every time there is a mix, uh, young GC, I go from 100% application time to, you know, 85, 100%, 85, 100%, 85, but then da down to 40%. It means that in those two seconds, maybe I had one, two, three collections, and even if each of those were fast, but they occupy time within those two seconds. So basically, my application doesn't run, all right? This is uh, the MMU if I enlarge the window to five seconds. And again, I go down to 60%. Of course, now the window is larger. So if many garbage collection happen, but you know the window is larger, so I get more application time. But still, in those five seconds from more or less here to here, 40% of time was spent in garbage collection, and only 60% was actually spent in application. So my application basically slows down and then it starts okay to full speed so g1 is the future no doubt cms deprecated uh you know low pose you gotta use g1 there are very good chances that it just works for your case you just set the maximum hip size you just set the target pose done you don't have to understand too much about g1 however if you run into problems or you want to tune it better, then you have to understand how it works. And, um, you know, this is what this session is all about. Um, try to always stay on the most recent JDK because um, G1 is based subject to very, uh, uh, a, a lot of updates in a very short period of time. And, uh, even if they do it now in JDK 9, they backport the changes to JDK 8. And those changes, every time they backport it or work on new features, um, they typically make a lot of difference. So be sure that you have a process to update the, the JDK to the most recent version, because you will get a lot of benefits if you're using G1. A couple of references, um, you go, you can, Go to SlideShare and search for G1 GC. You will find a bunch of uh, authors here, uh, mostly from Oracle. Um, you know, these are the most authors that I found useful. The, all the rest is basically happening on the OpenJDK mailing list for a spot. So that is all. If, I, if you have questions, I'll, I'll take them uh, via Slido. Yeah. All right, so performance penalty space needed for GC logging. Um, so GC logging is typically regarded as very low overhead. Um, you don't need to worry, typically. However, you have to make sure that there is nothing else using the disk on that particular machine. We, I actually uh, read about a case where there was a Redis instance on that same machine and uh, at a certain point Redis, Redis said oh I need to like re-index things or whatever the disk IO was all used by Redis 
and at that particular moment, the GC tried to write a log to the file, right? But because the disk was all used by Redis, that particular log statement lasted 30 seconds until Redis was done. When Redis was done, I say, hey, I'm done with the disk. <laughs> Return the disk to the, to the file, I mean, to the Java process, and then finally write the log to the disk, and uh, you're good. So, you know, typical sysop suggestions, you know, have your logs in separate partitions, separate disks, and da, 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 yada, yada, but typically you don't have to worry much. No more questions? So what is the performance penalty to maintain the card table and the, well, there is a performance penalty. Uh, those times are reported in the details that if you do print GC details, they are reported, the times uh, that you see there. Unfortunately, there's no way to get around it. Uh, it's a fundamental mechanism of how G1 works and you cannot get rid of it. Uh, that's, that's the way it is. So that's it. Sometimes it's heavy, but again, the bigger the heap, the better, because you have less work to do. Um, you know, trade-offs. You, you have to try to figure it out. Yes, more questions? Yes. Louder. They have removed perm space, yes. Yeah, so strings were before interned in the permanent generation. Now they are interned in the heap. I'm, the key point, well, I'm not sure they're interned in the heap. They are interned in the class file, I mean, wh which is loaded into the meta space. However, I I'm not sure about that. But even if they're loaded into the heap, they're probably going to end up very quickly in an old generation region, which is completely full. So G1 doesn't even look at that region because it says you are 100% full. If I process you, I get no benefit. I just don't process you. That's it. Yes. Yes. Uh, we could not use the old uh, parallel collector for our case because um, because uh, the poses that it was doing when doing the old generation collection were seconds, not possible for us. Like for this particular application, chess, you have to imagine that the most common match is one minute match. And uh, humans can actually move more than one piece a second. They can move like three pieces a second. So you really want to be fast. You can't wait one second because you lose three moves on the chessboard. Yeah. That's it? Okay. Thank you for listening. Thanks. <laughs>